That's a dot on the board. That's not a dot. So, that's taking a look dot. at what we've got so far. Oh. I hate everyone to join, I know. So, taking a look at what we've got so far, uh, you'll notice that I... I don't know how this got up here because I started with number three. I'm sorry. I said three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, whatever I got up to, and people ended up doing the first row. I specifically skipped the first row because I wanted to be the one who talked about it, and now we're looking at this, and I noticed that I think I might have to start from scratch. We're sorry. All right. That's all right. Let me start over here. I didn't say it's all wrong, but there's enough that's not correct that I'd rather go ahead and teach it and make sure that people have it. So if we were looking at lithium, for example, lithium, how many valence electrons does it have? One. How many dots will it get? One. I don't know why the plus three is there. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I wrote it there because I didn't know where I was. All right. You didn't know where you were? Yeah. Displays, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. All right, so now we're taking a look at column two. We have beryllium. How many valence electrons does it have? Two. How many dots will it get? <coughs> two. Now here's the part that I wanted to go through and make sure that people had a little bit better idea of, is where do the dots go? What do I mean by where do the dots go? What I want you to imagine is that if this is the generic symbol that we happen to be using for any particular element that we're working with, this area, this area, this area, and this area, we are all going to assume are equal orbitals. Meaning that what happens when you're filling up electrons? One. one will go in each one first before you start to double them up. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if we're doing that, for boron, how many dots should it have? It should have three, but where should the dots go? Top, side, one, and bottom. One, two, three. Carbon has how many dots? Four. Four, four rather than six. And there's going to be one, two, three. Or, we are not looking at nitrogen as a diatomic yet. So if we're just looking at nitrogen as a monatomic element, what should we write down? One, two, three, four. Where does the fifth one go? Top. Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, I want to make sure that that's clear. Where you put the fourth one doesn't matter because you're still going to double them up. If you want to put it on the top or the side, it does not matter. Oxygen does have six. However, where should they go? One on each side first, and then you double them up. So that would leave two unshared or unpaired electrons. Fluorine ends up being just fine. Neon ends up being fine. I'm just going to darken the dots so that way the camera can pick them up. All right, I'm going to erase helium for right now. So we have yet to fix the second row. Is sodium okay? Yeah. Yes, has one dot. We're all good. Magnesium, do I need to fix it? Yeah. Yes. What should I do? Put it on the side. Where should it go? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, as long as it's not next to the one that's already there. And then with aluminum. All right. And from here, we should be able to fill out the rest of it as well. Silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Questions on that part so far? Yes, sir. Mr. Penzelli, so the 2s2 orbital gets filled up before the 2p6 orbital, doesn't it? I mean, before the 2p orbital? So right now, the idea of, of orbitals is going to get a little bit skewed from what we just learned, because one of the things we haven't talked about is what's called hybridizing orbitals. And that's really what the new unit is going to be talking about, is where you take multiple orbitals and combine them and equal out the energies, more or less. Something that we'll get into and something that basically the Lewis dot structures automatically assumes that you already know how to do. You don't, which is okay. But right now, I'm betting you remember doing these Lewis dot structures before, and I wanted to review this before we started getting into the complexities of hybridization. Okay. All right, so now that we've got this part, what generalization can be made about Lewis dot structures in a group of elements? Uh... And by the way, group goes which way? Family goes which way? Period goes which way? 
How about I write those three terms down and you actually figure out which way they go on the periodic table? Group O family. Wait, period. Column. I'm sure I can make up more. <laughs> yes? That's what I'm asking you to determine oh. with your partner. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, the group is the column. Yeah. And I think family. Good times, good times. Oh. Oh, I didn't even notice those things. Family that's just like grouping something. same number of valence electrons. We all good with that? Sweet. What can you tell me about what's happening with the row? They're increasing. They're increasing number of valence electrons. Increasing number of valence electrons. So each time you're going across this way, you're adding an additional valence electron. This only works for the S and P block of electrons. Okay? Do not use it for D. Do not use it for F. Gets much more wicked and complicated within those sections, which we've already started to discuss in the last chapter. Yeah. Is the increasing number of valence electrons the period that doesn't work for DNA? So this, these sets of trends that we're looking at, oh, just works for the S and the P block of the periodic table. You'll notice that I even have this broken off into looking like the S and P block of the periodic table. Yeah. Make sense? All right, so let's do the annoying ones while we're at it. Not that you will be tested on this by the college board, because I don't think I will even test you on this either. Hydrogen I will, helium I will not. How many valence electrons will hydrogen have? One. One valence electron. <laughs> what about this one? How many valence electrons will it have? Two. Two. Why is it in column eight? Has the same properties, meaning also that it has a completely filled outside energy level. Okay? And with that, generally helium, again, being done as an exception, they end up pairing the two electrons next to each other. Why do they pair the electrons next to each other instead of going to the other side? How many orbitals does helium actually have? One. One orbital. And it puts both electrons in that one orbital. Will people ever ask you that? Probably not. I don't think they will. <laughs> a, random um, guy, a random guy comes to you on the street. Well, I'm talking about college board. But. <laughs> All right. <laughs> How many electrons are there? Um, Generalization can be made about loose dot structures we've talked about. In groups, they're going to have the same number of valence electrons, except for helium, which ends up only having two, but it fills up the outside energy level. If we're talking about 
rows or the periods, they're increasing numbers. Are you right, ready to do at least one? Yes? Okay, sodium as an atom ends up being Na with a dot. What's it going to do when it becomes an ion? It's going to lose it. So when it loses it, it's going to become Na+. Plus. Great, let's go ahead and do phosphorus. Phosphorus as an atom has how many valence electrons? Try again. Five. Two. Five. Two. One, two, three, four, five. What's it going to do when it becomes an ion? It's going to add three. Add three. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Brackets minus three in the corner. Yep. Finish off the rest. I want to trim. Put that up. Put the next one up and trim between it. Okay, we ready? We all good? SR. SR plus two. charge goes first though. Brackets up. When did I not put the brackets up? Yeah, I don't yes, ma'am. When it lost all the electrons, so there's nothing to hold. Oh. Does that make sense? The electrons are there to show that. Well, what did aluminum do with electrons? It died. I mean, it lost them. It lost them. So you'll notice that it has no more dots and has a plus three charge. But you'll notice that the phosphorus ended up gaining three electrons, which now means it has eight dots all to itself, and it's being a pig and holding onto them and not sharing. <laughs> Hence, the brackets. The brackets are there to show the selfish nature of those negative ions being able to hold on to those negative electrons. Questions on this part? Sweet. Let's take a look at what ionic compounds look like next. Oh, actually, no, we get the next periodic table. This one we're going to put over here. So now that you have this set up, I'm going to leave this up here. Wait, what's happening? All right, you are going on to the next page. I'm just leaving this here because I'm going to put the next portion of the periodic table. What I want you to do is write down what the most common ion is going to be for all the elements uh, that we had already gone through for the periodic table. Yeah. Most common. You'll notice that all of the column one elements end up having a positive one charge. Yeah. All the column two elements have a positive two charge. All column three elements have a positive three charge, and I skipped column four. Yeah. Then we take a look at the column <laughs> five, six, and seven, column and you'll notice that column filled. five, six, and seven, all of them have how many valence electrons drawn around them? Eight. 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 And you'll notice that the charge is negative three, negative two, negative one, and I'm sure that this is a pattern and trend that you had already familiarized yourself with before, but hopefully now have a little bit more cemented in your brain. Why did I not have you draw ions for column eight? Yes, sir. These are technically neutral or like natural. They're generally not going to form ions because they're not uh, going to gain or lose electrons in order to fill an outer energy level or to empty an outer energy level. As far as column four, how many valence electrons did we have before? Was that four. four. And to do that, we'd either have to add four more electrons or strip four more electrons away, and neither one of those is actually going to be the most stable way to go, which really means that column four forms covalent bonds Whoa. in general. And all we're currently talking about are ionic ones. Don't worry, we will get to covalent bonds in great detail. Okay. Ooh.
does not exist? It does not form islands. It does exist. All right. <laughs> Questions on that top half? Good times. Good times. Okay. Going to transport once again. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's just like a roller coaster ride. What's that? It's Magna. All right, so now that we have actually completed the ions over here, what we're going to be looking at is drawing the Lewis structures or um, for the formula units for ionic compounds. How many people remember when we talked about formula units being different from molecules? Oh, Maybe. FU. Yeah, so three types of particles. I remember that. Atoms, molecules, and formula units. Don't forget the third one. So, <laughs> and we abbreviated if, you, if you're lazy and don't want to write it out, FU would be just perfectly fine. So atoms, molecules, formula units. Got the general trend? Yay. What's the difference between a formula unit and a molecule? Um, why don't I show you, what would you do with image? I would hopefully ha have them come in and I would explain it to them. All right. Look at that structure. Whoa, it's salt. It is salt. So then the question is, if that's a structure for salt, um, which one goes with which one? In other words, if you're trying to pick a green sphere that goes with another green sphere, which one goes with which? They kind, they're not sharing. But there's no real partner that's dedicated to each other. In a molecule, they are attached in individual chunks that move around separately from the other ones. But in this, are these individualized chunks that move separately from other ones? No, this is one big cluster of stuff. It's not going to be moved around separately. So this is an ionic crystal. If I was trying to represent the lowest whole number ratio of that ionic crystal, how would I go about doing that? What would it be for this one? What's the lowest whole number ratio for the ion to ion in this crystal? This one's a one to one, isn't that nice? So this one's just going to be NaCl. This representation is a representation of the entire unit of stuff. So it's one unit of that entire crystal. So this is the formula that represents this entire unit, which is why they call it a formula unit. Uh -huh. right? So if you want to write down the definition of a formula unit, that's probably a good idea, and I should probably really come up with a good one. Um, lowest whole number ratio of, not four, of cations to anions. Yes, you are correct. It is the same as a empirical formula. Can an ionic compound ever have a molecular formula? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, not. Does it have molecules? Yes. No. We just got done saying that. What do ionic compounds have instead of molecules? Formula units. Lowest whole number ratios of cations to anions. What's that? How many molecules does this thing have? And like zero. Correct. And I've done that to you before. It really ticked you off the last time. When did you do that? Last spring or last fall? Excuse me. Like in like August. First test. I remember that. The only one I remember that's the name. The name one on the nuclear test? That was pretty vicious. Any questions on definition for this that we've got so far? All right, so what I'd like to do, what's the first problem that's on the bottom there? Is it say I, um, my magnesium and fluorine? All right, let me just add an additional screen so I have something to work with here. Okay, so for the answer that I'm looking for, you've got magnesium and fluorine. And I could spell it correctly would be a good thing. Magnesium. Initially, don't worry about drawing all this out. Let me go through the entire process and then tell you what it is I'm looking for on the worksheet itself. Does that seem reasonable? Great. Magnesium as an element would look like this. Fluorine would look like this. What does magnesium have to do in order to become more? Lose two. 
How many will the fluorine over here have, be able to take? One. One. So. Two. Uh, let me try this. So what's magnesium going to do? No. <laughs> This might work. Modern problems require modern solutions. All right, so magnesium is going to lose one electron. What's it going to do? Beep. And when it goes over here, what happens? The fluorine becomes negatively charged. What did this become when it lost just the one? Plus one. Is magnesium done yet? No, which means that what? There's got to be another fluorine that's around. And the magnesium is going to get rid of that one. Never mind that dot. And when that happens, what charge is this going to become? Negative one. Technically, in my opinion, we're not done yet. Let me explain why we're not done yet. Will this hang out next to that? No. Why not? They're both negative and they're going to repel. We all good with that part so far? Great. And when they do that, this is going to be a little bit more complicated. Let's see if I can get this to happen. Yay. Doesn't it have to be a plus two, right? Yes, now it is a plus two. Overall, if you were to add up all the charges across all the ions itself, it should add up to be what? Zero. 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 Great. Do the page. Just have people post it for all of them. Not all of them are 100% correct because I think that people forgot to read part of the actual instructions to say write the formula down when you are done. When you're writing the formula out for these, uh, which formula gets written first, the positive or the negative? Positive. Positive. So the formula for the aluminum with the fluorine is going to be? ALF3. ALF3. Great. And other than that, I'm perfectly fine with the way that the hand is written. You'll notice that they end up having the negative ions staggered around the aluminum so that way they are not touching each other, so the negatives aren't next to the negatives, and they're close to positive. We end up taking at the lithium and the sulfur, Li2S is all good for me. This one ends up showing the atom process going to here. Um, this answer is correct. I am going to put in this bracket to make sure, and I'm going to write this a little bit larger so you can see why I was having some difficulties with it. Na, Br, written like this makes it look like what? Well, it makes it look like this sodium is doing what with these, with well, this bromine? Yeah. It looks electrons. like it's sharing oh, electrons. Geez. Do you see what I'm talking about? And that's one of the reasons that I wanted people to put the brackets in. Specifically, the brackets show the this thing here does not have contact with these electrons. It just has an attraction to it. It does not get to share those. It gets to just basically stick next to it like a magnet. So while I am fine with this particular answer, I did want to extend that bracket down to make sure that you saw that it was not connected. It basically looked like this. Uh, formula for it is to end up being NAMBR. Uh, for the strontium and bromine, SRBR2 is all good. Calcium and oxygen, CaO. For the sodium and the nitrogen, Na3N. For the barium nitride, uh, the barium nitride, I'm going to take out the two electrons here, put a plus two, put in the brackets, put the minus one, and put the minus one up there. And it is BAI2, so the formula is correct. The barium and the phosphorus ends up being correct. BA3P2, <coughs> potassium and chlorine ends up being K and Cl, both of the plus and a minus one charge. Questions on that one? in the past eh, 50 minutes or so. We have taken care of all of ionic compounds. 
other than talking about some of the properties of ionic compounds, we are done with drawing ionic compounds. Literally the next two weeks is drawing molecular structures, which means covalent. Is covalent going to be drawn like this? No. no. And what's going to be really cool is that for the like, next week and a half, we're going to be drawing covalents. So you get really good at covalents, and then all of a sudden you'll forget how to do these entirely. So like every other day or so, I'm going to give you an ionic problem just to do the ionic problem to keep it fresh in your brain, and hopefully you don't screw it up. Make sense on that part so far? Yes. Sweet. Yes, sir. If it's sufficient, it's mostly going to be just drawing the molecular, the molecular structures. Does that mean we're only going to have an FRQ? Uh, no, we're going to have multiple choices as well. There are properties that we can discuss as well, yes, and so we'll also get to other stuff as well. It's quite, quite easier than it could sink a It is. <laughs> Taking a look at the next page, you will notice that it now starts talking about drawing Lewis structures for covalent compounds. This is one of those that you can read with your group and answer together as a group. Uh, so if you wanted to, plus we have to start work on it, sounds good. Uh, I will have you put answers up on the wall in just a little while. Oh, actually both. So if we're taking a look, these are the answers for numbers 1 through 7 on the front page, except for number 4, because number 4 it said for you to verify. And there's really nothing for you to write down, you just have to make sure you counted them. Uh, but other than that, I believe these are correct. Any questions on page 1? No. Okay, I would anticipate that you should be able to actually finish all of this stuff to page two. you should finish up to page and including to page eight before I'm hoping you either leave today or before the start of class on Wednesday again on Wednesday I do expect you to have started to read and take notes Wednesday. on chapter nine I'm, yes that's what I said Wednesday I was checking yes okay. Wednesday okay. Yes. Okay. notes are going to be due Friday Wednesday <laughs> I will put it on the calendar. We'll see what I pick up. Okay, yes. Number eight. And we're going to take a look at number eight, please. In SF3, sulfur is a central atom. Uh, you can tell which atom is a central atom by simply looking at formula. How does the formula give away which atom is a central one? Yes, sir? It's placed first. It's placed first. Oftentimes they are placed first. It's not always, but oftentimes. What else? Yep. There's one. There's one of them. Usually there's only one of them if it's going to be the central atom. So number nine, identify the central atom in each of the following molecules. CO2, it's going to be? C. Carbon. For B, it's going to be? C. Phosphorus. And for SiO2, it's going to be? Si. SI. Number ten, for each of the compounds from question nine, how add up how many valence electrons should be in the bonding picture. A is done for you. A is 16. Phosphorus with hydrogen is going to have eight. And then silicon dioxide is going to have? 16. 16. Questions on that one? All right. For each of the compounds from question number nine, add up how many valence electrons? Oh, I did that one. The number of electrons that should appear in the bonding picture for CO3, 2 minus, is 22. Excuse me, for CO3 is 22. For the number of electrons that appear in the picture of CO3, 2 minus, it's 24. Offer an explanation for why CO3, 2 minus, has 24 electrons instead of 22 has a negative two charge. Where did it get the two extra electrons from? It yes. grabbed it from something. It grabbed it from something that gave it away. Okay, so if it was some metal that ended up losing electrons, it grabbed from it, uh, from it losing electrons. The number of electrons that should be in the, included in the picture of NH4 should be nine, but the number of electrons that's actually in the picture of NH4 plus is eight. What happened? Positive one charge, what did it do with electrons? Lost an electron. General rule, negative ions, you have to add electrons. Positive polytomic ions, you have to subtract. Sweet. Go on to the next page, folks. Basically, I'm hoping you'll be able to get through up to and including page, well, definitely up through and including page 8. And let's see if you can have page 9 done for Wednesday start of class. And when we get page 9 on Wednesday, what I'll have you do is start putting them up on the wall and we'll start talking about them.